Good evening. Uh, the faster you pay attention to me, the faster we get to leave. I am going to do two things this evening. I am going to quickly go over what to expect on the midterm. I don't do a formalized review because I record my lectures. And I always find it stupid trying to cover six weeks worth of material in an hour and a half. I don't know if you've had profs that do those kinds of reviews where they go through 150 slides, 300 slides in an hour and a half. They're like, this, 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 this. I don't do that. I'm going to give you guys the breakdown of how the questions are pretty much broken down and what kind of questions to expect. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start with that. Then I'm going to do a, a one more normalization exercise so that you guys can experience that one more time. So without further ado, the, the breakdown of the midterm is as follows. So there's 11 questions on general and conceptual modeling. This includes um, understanding what entities are, what attributes are. You like that last one, eh? I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, so those are generally questions that have to do with understanding um, entities, what attributes are, uh, what turns you know entities into a conceptual diagram. That kind of stuff. Uh, five questions on keys. Basically, primary keys, surrogate keys, foreign keys. Do you understand what those are? Normalization, eight questions. Three questions are literally the definition of normalization. The three types of, like, one, two, three. Know the definitions, you'll do fine. Um, there's ten questions, and I put this under relations entities and relationships. This is basically... Uh, understanding what one-to-many, many-to-many, uh, what actually makes up a proper relation. Uh, that's all in the slides. Uh, physical modeling, there's three questions about that. Uh, for some unknown reason, I, I did quickly scan the midterm like a couple of weeks ago when they sent it out. And I didn't realize that they basically gutted the physical modeling section of the test. Because uh, originally the midterm was 50 questions. It's 35. So they took out a lot of questions. Um, so there's like questions of if you're targeting X database system, what kind of modeling is this? Those kinds of questions. There's one general questions about database management systems. Um, that's because I couldn't figure out what category you put it in. Um, it might be along lines of which of the following is not a relational database. So if you remember like that first week slide that had a bunch of databases on the same slide, your answer's on there. And then I have WTF. Um, those are two questions where I look at them and I didn't know the answer. So I am, but of course I was only allowed to modify the test only so much. So that's, you know, hang on. So essentially there's two questions and actually, so those of you that have done hybrid, I mean not hybrid, the um, lab five quiz have already experienced one of those stupid questions where there doesn't seem to be a correct answer. Those two questions are like that. There's like one question on there. You, you really go, none of these sound right. This one sounds pretty close. So you got to pick like three out of the five options. And you, no matter which, after I looked at it, I go, no, that's not right. But then again, the other option it said was right is also not right. So I, I think what's happened there is the prof that wrote those based on the way he teaches the class, not in a manner generic to the whole seven separate lecturers. Sorry, six, because I count for two. Six different lecturers. So this, of course, midterm was written by some by him. So there's a few questions of that nature in there. I did do some changes to the midterm, especially in the short answer section. Um, kind of looks like this. And uh, you're going to have two pages at the back where you have space to write or to draw. And there is literally two questions. And I'm going to flash this really fast so nobody can take a picture. Um, where you have the choice of Two short answers, a normalization or a diagram. You pick two out of the four. They're worth five points each. Um, outside of that, you're going to do the yield scantron experience. Uh, have you guys done scantron yet? 
Have you experienced Scantron yet here at the college? Um, you might have had it at other schools, but if you went to um, Carleton or U of O, their Scantron machine's way better than ours. Um, you will experience the following thing. You have, try that again. Okay. Blue's dead. Try the other blue. Most of you have seen this experience at least, you know, the five bubbles. What most people don't realize is the way Scantron reads it. Scantron reads left to right, top to bottom. Which is why we say bring a really good eraser. Because you'll have people that go, oh, this is the right answer. Then after about five minutes, they'll go, shoot, that's not the right answer. So they kind of do this. And then they fill in another one over here. If this isn't well cleaned out, it's reading from left to right. It grabs that one, which is where a lot of people have problems with scan control. So don't panic. It's not that sensitive. But if you do a shitty job erasing, it's going to be, you know, on you. Um, the other thing you need to know about Scantron is when you fill the bubbles, this does not work. This does not work. This does not work. This might work. Literally. Color the whole thing. Because if that sheet goes in half a millimeter off, it's not going to catch this or this. So fill it in all the way. Um, the other thing I'm going to be doing is double checking. And of course, um, that you have filled out your student number properly and your name. Uh, often people will just write their name and their student number on it and not actually fill out the bubbles. If you do that, I have no way of knowing whose test it is. Because it goes in an envelope, I walk it over to the test center and drop it off in a bin. I don't get those test papers back for a week and a half. I get the results next business day, usually. But I don't get the actual papers back a week and a half. Guess when the grades are due for the midterm during the reading week. Which is the following Monday. And the happy part is because of Cal. Um, I can't pick up the Cal tests on Thursday night because I've got people writing right till when they close. And my second group of students, not you guys, the group after you guys, their test runs till 8.15. Cal closes at 8. So there's no way I can get the tests. So I'm coming back Friday morning, which means even if I drop them off, the earliest I'm going to get the tests is Monday. So it is what it is. So just remember, when you do your Scantron sheet, Make sure to fill in the student number bubbles, the name bubble. On the Other than the answers, that's the only thing on there you need to fill out. I wish I grabbed my Scantron sheet and I forgot it at home. Um, it is what it is. And make sure you fill in your bubbles and you'll be good. Um, outside of that, out of all the questions, there is only one correct answer, theoretically. There should only be one. Um, I am not going to take paper attendance in class because you literally have to write on the test paper. I don't get a test paper with your name on it. You were not here. If you were not here, guess what your grade's going to be? Absolutely. And I'm not talking about the people in Cal. Don't panic. Those that write in Cal, they take care of that for me. Um, but yes, if you were not here, in other words, I don't have a test paper with your name on it. and. It has an area on the front for your student number, your name, and your signature. And when it says your name, print it with English letters. I can't read Chinese nor Korean. And I've had people literally write their name in Chinese and Korean. I'm like, I don't know who that is. Because before I started requiring the student number. So now I got the student number, so there's a, you know, a 50-50 chance I can figure out who you are. But I have actually done that, toss tests, because I can't identify who the test was for. That's just what it is, right? If I can't read it, that's, you know, might as well not have even written. Um, 
yeah, during a, the midterm and the final exam is the only time I'm really brutal with some of the stuff. Too many students, not enough time to really be chasing people down. Yes. How oh, bad's your cursive? Does it look like a dog threw up on your paper? Or does it actually look like it's supposed to, like when they taught us to us in grade three and grade four? Well, you're going to get to sign your name in cursive, but print your name. Okay. Like, everybody knows how to print. Not everybody knows how to write cursive. Um, but as long as your cursive is reasonable, I should be able to read it. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about the midterm? Going once, going twice. Through time, we're done. You had your chance. Okay. Now, I am going to use, this is going to be my example for my normalization exercise. And it's pretty much the same concept as we did last time, except it's not coming out of a textbook. It's that I pulled it out of my head. Um, so when we look at, oops, hang on. It's, there we go. There was a piece missing. Okay. so. I'm gonna go kill one of these lights really quick because that I opened a ticket two weeks ago about the bulb. Well, apparently he uh, did not change it because the light's still flashing and it's still dim as dim can be. So tech support did not come and change the bulb in that projector. I don't know what's going on, but it's usually bright enough to burn your retinas. Okay. Um, so right now we have a relation and it's a valid relation because it has complete rows of data. It has, um, columns with, you know, values in them and each intersection of a row and a column is atomic. It has only single value in each one of them, but we're not in first normal form because we have not picked out our primary key. So to be in first normal form, it must be a proper relation. The values must be atomic, no repeating groups of columns. And there must be a primary key. So we've got to figure out our primary key. And when we look at it, we have a couple of columns that look promising for primary keys. We have employee number. We have rate ID and invoice number. Now, when we look at it, we will realize that Employee number is probably pretty safe to add as part of our primary key. Uh, rate ID is not going to work as part of our primary key by itself because um, rows four and five, literally the values for both employee ID and the rate ID, employee number and rate ID dupl are duplicated. So we can't use that as our primary key. However, if we look at the invoice number plus the employee, num employee number, we suddenly realize the combination of those two gives us a unique row. So we will say these two, and that's going to be our starting point. So from this point on, I'm going to move over to the board, and I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. Pull out all my happily colored markers. Yeah, that's going to work. Green was good. Red was good. Mm, purple? Yeah. Okay. Orange is good, actually. Okay. So I'm going to transcribe the columns over here to put myself in first normal form because it's important to at least have that up on the board. One. Like such. And actually, what's going to happen is I'm actually going to go past just normalizing this. I'm actually going to diagram the two so that you guys see the whole shooting process, shooting match. So we have employee number, which we know is part of our primary key. Actually, I'm going to use a different color for that. Um, employee name. I just name. Oh, heck. That's right. I planned this so that it would fit on the whiteboard. Name. 
email, rate, ID, hourly rate, invoice, number, project, description, Okay, and I wanted to mark my primary keys, which we're gonna do in green today, like this. So technically we are currently in first normal form. Um, we've eliminated repeating groups of columns. They weren't any to start with, but you know, we got rid of them. We identified a primary key and all the values are atomic. So we're in first normal form, we're in good shape. So then we wanna go into second normal form Uh, so we want to do 2 and F. To be able to go into 2 and F, what's the definition of 2 and F? Anybody remember what the definition of 2 and F is? Okay, yes. And is that what you were going to say? Did you even hear what he said? If I understood what he said, because he kind of mumbled halfway through it, was there'll be no partial dependencies. So we have to identify our partial dependencies. And we also should identify our full dependency while we're at it, because, you know, it'd be a good thing to do. So for now, we're going to identify our partials. So the project description is probably voice, very likely. Um, the, we know for a fact, name and email have to do with the employee. The one we have an unknown about is actually the rate ID and the hourly rate. Because that could go as a toss up. Uh, I, when I made this one, I left it kind of vague. Because in theory, um, if you look at the first two rows, Jane Doe actually has a different hourly rate based on the project description. So, even though the columns are to the left of the invoice, realistically, they're probably it's probably part of the invoice and not part of the employee. So workflow planning is cheaper than UX design. Uh, but for some unknown reason, uh, server prep has two different rates also because of somebody else doing it. So the rate ID is a bit of a mystery. So in this case, we, but when we look at it, we can determine that, yeah, probably rate ID is part of the invoice. So we'll mark it as part of the invoice. But by the same token, you could theoretically throw it in as part of the uh, employee, but we have some conflicts if we did it that way. And the last one we have left is hours. And for hours, it's a combination of the employee number, yeah, the employee number and the invoice number. Like such. Okay, so we currently have um, two partial dependencies, one full dependency. We're not worrying about anything transitive yet because that's for later. So. The, what we end up doing is we'll take anything that's blue, we'll blow it out to its own entity. Anything that's purple will also go to its own entity. Just blue is partial, purple is full. So let's go, we're first with uh, creating a sales and entity called employee. Now we're gonna have an entity called uh, invoice. And even that's not gonna work quite right for us when we look at it, because as I'm working it through, it's not gonna work quite right. Uh, because we have, um, no, actually it'll work, I lied. Um, the rate IDs are unique per invoice, yeah. No, no, those are, um, 
So the invoice number is the same, but it's different to employees because they might have both worked on the same invoice. So we got an invoice. Um, in actual fact, to really do this properly, we actually do need to include the rate ID as part of our primary key. Watch. It's not unheard of uh, to go with a three-way uh, primary key. I'm going to add it in for shits and giggles. Um, specifically, because it suddenly becomes really, really difficult. To identify what rate belongs to what, which means it goes like this in the end. The reason why you'll notice I started working on second normal form and I realized while I was working on it that my first assumption was incorrect. That's actually normal part of the process. Sometimes you'll start and realize, hey, my assumption was wrong. There's no way I can actually break this down the way I expected it to because it just doesn't work. Even though at first you think you can go, hey, the rate ID works with the, I mean, the employee number plus the invoice is good enough to figure out our hours, which is true. The problem we have is the rate ID, which also belongs to the invoice. The second we have that invoice number in there twice, we have two lines for the invoice for the rate also. So suddenly our invoice has an issue. So we end up having to include all three um, just so that we can actually make each row completely unique. And we end up having to blow out the entire thing as follows. So then we have rates. And we have hours. So our employee has which ends up being foreign keys. And what happened when I did this is that we accidentally dropped straight into third normal form. The second I made a three with a three-week key, which some of you working on lab five may have experienced where if you do the two-part key, there's a transitive dependency, but if you chose to do the three-part key, there's no transitive, it broke straight down. So lab five had two different solutions. Lab 5 had two ways to tackle it. The final result would be the same, almost identical, with just a small variation. And essentially what happened here is literally what would have happened in Lab 5 if you picked the three-part key, where all the different entity pieces all land down here. Um, in actual fact, there's even some question, question about, questionable stuff here with the uh, project description because it could theoretically go into the hours as well. And the reason why this one is so ambivalent is there's literally a piece of data missing. Right from the top, there was a piece of data missing. There really should be some sort of project ID included in this. If you add a single column in here for a project ID, it would have fixed itself right off the bat. It would not have been messy. Like this is messy. If you had a project ID, it would not have been messy. Um, then what would have happened is we would have had a compound key of uh, employee number, invoice number, and then everything else, the rate ID, project ID, everything would have been part of the hours. 
on the first pass and we would have had two transitives at that point. We would have had the rate being transitive and the project description being tra um, transitive. And because we don't have that in there, we suddenly, um, well, have a problem. Um, the point of this particularly messy example, just because it is messy, was to show that sometimes you will actually get an example that doesn't work. Like no matter which way you skin this cat, it's not going to be perfect. The closest you're going to be able to do is literally using a three-part key and end up with this. And I will take this now and I'll diagram it so you guys get to see the whole process from start to end. But if we had just one more column there of some sort of some sort of thing we could use as an identifier, it would come out cleaner, if that makes sense. Um, but such is life. You don't always ha get to have everything you want. And sometimes you just have to work with what you're given. Um, realistically, in the end, we probably would have had to uh, move the project description into the hours. Because that way, at least, it would have been tied to the rate. And it would have made it more unique. But still, that doesn't make sense because the rate has nothing to do with the project. Okay. So... If I were to draw this, it would have we'd do um, like that and then we just throw in our well add our attributes so we have our name and email this we also have our employee number we have our invoice number and this is a primary key. That's our primary key. We have the description, which at this point in time, no matter what, I'm not happy about it, but it is what it is. Rate, ID, and the hourly rate. And in here we have the actual hours. Yeah, that's how I spell hours. So we have the actual hours. Now, the only thing that's missing on here is our cardinality. So each each set of hours is probably tied to one employee and only one employee. Uh, each set of hours, when we look at it, is probably tied to only one rate and to one invoice because hours is a weak entity because it needs all three parts of the foreign keys to be identifiable. Which, you know, if you remember the other symbols we'd see, this is so much easier to draw on a computer. Identifying relationships. And each invoice um, needs to have an hour. A given rate can be used on multiple invoices, might not be used on any invoice. In theory, an employee will have multiple hours, but may not have any if they were on vacation that week. And we can go from that to this. And then we can take this and convert it into a physical diagram, which will look something as follows.
So this is our primary key. I'm not going to try to draw a key. I'm going to write primary key. Our employee number is probably an integer. Uh, name is probably a var car. No idea how big the name is going to be, so we'll go with 150. And email. You guys remember my story about email addresses. It's going to be 150, not 75. He actually remembered the exact number. Good job. Um, then we're going to do our rates. We have ratings. All of this. We have our rate ID. That it ID is our primary key, and again, it's likely to be an integer. The rate it's a numeric value that probably has reference money. So, what would be our best data type for this? Good, um, decimal. And we look at our numbers over here. Of course, this is Excel, so it's not formatted right, so we don't see the, the periods, but it's pretty safe to say that it's probably a five comma two. In other words, it'll allow up to 999.99. Five comma two. Five comma two. We are. Absolutely. A decimal five comma two. Write it here, then erase it. This means that it can hold. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'll go a little bit past that and I'll use colors. Five comma two. This allows us to store. Five digits. Two reserved for decimal places. Of the five. It's not five plus two. It's total five with two reserved for decimal. No, you could not. 999 and 99 cents. If you wanted to go 1500, you'd have to go 62. All right. And our invoice numbers are PK. Again, it's probably an integer. And the description's probably a var car. Let's go with 50, just for argument's sake. And then we just have our hours. Table. And we're going to have employee number, uh, rate ID, invoice number, and hours. Now, here's what's cool. So these guys are all PKs. But they're also born keys. And once we start on this last little bit, whenever you create foreign keys, they always have to match 
the data type of their source key. So in this case, we're lucky because they're all integers. So these would all be ints. It'll do it for you automatically. But if you change it in the source table after you create a relationship, it won't. So you have to drop the relationship and yeah. It's not smart enough to know post. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I've used much better piece of software, and they, they don't still don't know. It's just a limitation of the design software. Uh, hours, as far as we can tell, they're all integers. There was nobody put in any half hours or anything like that, so I don't know what the billing policy is at this company. But it's usually pretty safe to say that most companies bill by the half hour. Um, it's usually pretty safe. Some companies only built by the day, like the company I work for, we have an, a daily rate. We work for an hour, you get billed for a day. We work for six hours, you get billed for a day. It's because that one hour that say a developer is working on could have also involved a project manager for half an hour and the, the relationship manager for two hours. So we always charge a full day for no matter how much work because it covers the cost of the other people involved in the project. These guys, I'm just going to go and assume that potentially there's the, the possibility of um, half hours is there. So I'll set this up to be a decimal. Uh, three comma one. And last thing we need to draw is our crow's feet. And this is how we went from normalization all the way to a physical diagram start to end. This, what I just did on the board in the last half hour, 40 minutes, was literally an entire summary of this whole semester. It's the best kind of review when it doesn't look like a review. But this basically cut everything for the whole semester, like so far, for the first six weeks. In one long example. So, super simplified example, of course, because there's only so much whiteboard space, but that's, you know, the end result of normalization down to a physical diagram. Outside of that, that, that was it for today. So I'm ready to field any questions about what I just did. Uh, outside of that, if you don't have any questions, you're free to roll. I told you guys it was going to be the shortest lecture ever. Yeah. There's no lab exam. Theory exam only. Just kidding. It's going to be 14 hours long on Saturday at 6 a.m. I'm kidding. Kidding. That's actually your final exam. Uh, the, the tentative date and time for it is a Saturday at 8 a.m. So that's what I saw. I wasn't any happier than you because I don't get up at 8 on Saturday usually. So Uber's going to make a killing off everybody. But that's the tentative schedule. It's not a done deal, but that's the tentative schedule. The final schedule, probably in about two weeks, three weeks. So, it, yeah, around week nine, week, yeah, about, it's tentative. So don't panic yet. But uh, I don't know why they went and scheduled it for like three hours instead of two hours, which I think is why they put it in at eight, because they need the room at 11 for another group. And that's the other policy about Algonquin, right? You might not have realized yet. You will never have two final exams on the same day, which is why we have exams. How many classes do you guys have? Six. Only six have exams. Um, six or seven classes. You have an exam for each one. You're only allowed one exam a day. It has to go on to the weekend. Um, I know last semester we, we had two Saturday exams. So both Saturdays. But it is what it is, right? But your midterm, don't forget, will be here at 5 o'clock next week, unless you're in Cal. Go to your appropriately booked time. <laughs>
And I have not had anywhere near enough cow bookings for the number of cow accommodations I've received. So you probably want to do that sooner than later. Because I can't give you extra time in this room. Not for this course. Weeks five. That's the policy we've had for the last three years. It's probably pretty safe to say it's going to be the same policy. I'm going to hedge my bets. We go, at this point in time, I'm 90% certain that we're going to have the same policy. And it's going to be very similar to this, where you're going to have 35, 40 questions, multiple guests, and then a couple of, uh, in this case, will be write some SQL. And 